For the first time since 2010, the BRICS group is expanding. Six nations have been invited to join the group, and we will discuss what this means for the Global South. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Caleb, sitting in for Anand Naidu, and you're watching The Heat. Welcome, everyone. Chinese President Xi Jinping is calling the expansion of BRICS, a group of emerging economies, historic and a new starting point for cooperation. Six countries are invited to join Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa as full members of the bloc beginning in January of 2024. The nations include Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. CGTN's Daniel Arapmoy begins our coverage with this report from Johannesburg. The five-member bloc reached a consensus on the guiding principles, standards, criteria, and procedure of admission into the BRICS community of nations. The first phase has seen the admission of six new members into the bloc. We have decided to invite the Argentine Republic, the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates to become full members of BRICS. The membership will take effect from the 1st of January 2024. The leaders have tasked the bloc's foreign ministers to further develop the BRICS partner country model and a list of prospective partner countries. Their report is expected to be submitted to the leaders during the next summit to be held in Russia. Now, the GDP of the BRICS is going up to 37% of the world's GDP in terms of purchasing power and 46% in terms of the world's population. The six new members of the BRICS community are expected to bring to the table close to $3 trillion, with Saudi Arabia alone bringing in $1 trillion. Egypt currently makes up $0.4 trillion, while Ethiopia will be coming in with $0.15 trillion. The expansion and modernization of BRICS is a message that all institutions in the world need to mold themselves according to changing times. According to the Chinese President Xi Jinping, the expansion is a new starting point to the BRICS cooperation agenda. This membership expansion is historic. It shows the determination of BRICS countries for unity and cooperation with the broader developing countries. It meets the expectations of the international community and the common interests of emerging market countries and developing countries. Let us work together to write a new chapter of emerging market countries working together in unity for development. The leaders reaffirmed their readiness in exploring opportunities for improving the stability, reliability and fairness of the global financial architecture. They collectively agreed to task finance ministers to consider the issue of local currencies, payment instruments and platforms and report back by the next summit. The summit also hosted leaders from Africa and the Global South in the BRICS Africa Outreach and BRICS Plus Dialogue. According to the leaders, BRICS has embarked on a new chapter to build a world that is fair, a world that is just, a world that is also inclusive and prosperous. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Now for more on the expansion of the BRICS Alliance, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Johannesburg is... Elizabeth Sideropoulos. She is the chief executive of the South African Institute of International Affairs. From Washington, D.C., Anton uh, Fadashin. He is a Russian affairs expert and a professor of history at American University. And joining me here in the studio, Fabiano Conuto. He's a senior fellow with the Policy Center for the New South and a former vice president of the World Bank. And we have Jan Liang, Liang, rather, excuse me, a chair professor of economics at Willamette University in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Jan Liang, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, certainly, one could say BRICS is certainly flexing its muscle right now, both from a, a political standpoint 
and from an economic standpoint, and really opening up a new chapter in what is going to be more cooperation and development among emerging nations. That is so important because obviously many of these nations feel they have been simply ignored by the West, including the United States. So what does this addition of six nations mean for the bloc, especially in terms of economic growth and sustainable development? Yeah, good talk to you, Sean. Um, you're right. I think the really the core objectives of the BRICS and now BRICS Plus is really to foster the sustainable development and also to improve the multilateral system in terms of global governance, because the global south for a long time has not been voicing, um, not having their concerns heard, having their voice heard in the global uh, landscape. So I think by including more members, it simply means that it expands the force um, of the global south, um, that they're able to cooperate among each other, to take advantage of each other's advantages. Uh, the new members, for example, um, many of them are big exporters of oil, uh, which is very strategic assets um, for global economic development. And many of them also occupy very strategic geopolitical locations. Uh, or they also um, symbolize really the counterweight to the Western-led multilateral system um, as we have right now. So I think it's important for all these countries to come together. And the corporations can come in many different shapes and forms. And I think for economic corporations, there are a lot of uh, connections in trade, in finance, in investment, and also in technological corporations. So I think, as President Xi mentioned, this is a new chapter. This is going to be new, um, you know, sort of uh, new new journey for all these countries to come together to take advantage of their advantages, um, their, their strengths, and cooperate and, and really uh, move forward. Indeed. Elizabeth, no shortage, <clears throat> excuse me, of nations that really want to join BRICS. There's some uh, between 22 or 23, whichever report you're reading, and some 40 countries are uh, observing, and many in African nations were invited to this year's uh, BRICS meeting. From a standpoint, what does this mean for South Africa, hosting uh, this, the BRICS summit? Some analysts suggesting that this expansion is really going to be a, a, a complete challenge, uh, especially to the United States and other uh, nations, if you consider the IMF and World Bank and funding programs that the developed nation often believes are simply overlooked by these more established, if you will. Uh, but now the United States and others looking at this as perhaps a threat to something like the G7. Yes, I mean, I think if you compare uh, the, the way in which I think the West uh, uh, looked at, at the BRICS when it was first uh, established uh, uh, more than a decade ago, 50, 15 years ago, I think uh, that uh, that perspective and that approach has really shifted, and we've seen it in, in a very fundamental way in terms of the amount of interest that, it's gen that this summit has generated in the West um, uh, very, very clearly. Um, I think... Certainly, from uh, from from South Africa's perspective, this was also the first uh, summit um, that happened in person uh, uh, post uh, post the pandemic, uh, and I think it 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 was a uh, certainly you know so South Africa sees this as as a great diplomatic um, success, the ability to bring together not just uh, the BRICS nations but also um, uh, many and numerous African heads of state, which of course is not the first time that South Africa has reached out in the context of the BRICS, as well as other uh, global South partners. And then, of course, to be uh, to be the summit at which the second um, expansion of the uh, 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 of the BRICS right. the BRICS happens. Uh, Ataviano, uh, Brazilian President Lula da Silva is supporting uh, Argentina's uh, uh, invitation, uh, joining uh, the BRICS summit. And Argentina right now simply being punished by inflation. As bad as it can be argued in other places, you're talking about more than 100% uh, in some areas. I want you to hear what Argentina's president had to say about BRICS and the importance and uh, joining the, uh, uh, the entity. A new scenario is opening up for Argentina. We are going to be protagonists of a common destiny in a bloc that represents more than 40 percent of the world's population, and at the same time, we continue to strengthen our fruitful, autonomous, and diverse relations with other countries in the world. And we talked about the inflation, more than 100 percent, and also right now Argentina is struggling to pay back a $44 billion loan from the IMF. What does this BRICS alliance give them. Is this a lifeline? Oh, well, it's a pleasure to be here, Sean. Uh, the, the fact is that 
uh, for instance, China has provided a timeline for, uh, for Argentina to uh, pay the commitment with the IMF, the service, mm -hmm. without having to resort to dollars given the scarcity. In fact, negative, the reserves, foreign reserves of Argentina as of now uh, are negative uh, were not for the bilateral swaps that it has with China. So I understand that the, uh, the uh, groupings like BRICS, they serve two purposes, uh, very much complementary. On the one hand, they are a forum uh, for cooperation uh, and at the same time for uh, strengthening the, the positions right. of the countries. And, and originally, the BRICS was created at the time, I was uh, an officer at, uh, at the multilateral institutions, to exactly enhance the position of those countries in discussions about capital uh, raising and so on. And it became clear after the, uh, the, the packages of uh, negotiated among the shareholders of World Bank and IMF that there would be a limit uh, to the extent to which these countries would, let's say, uh, uh, increase their share. Right. So they decided, okay, so it's okay, and then we create another one. And, and, and that was not big enough, and then China created the AIIB. Right. And, and I, I believe that, uh, going back to Argentina, uh, one of the topics of the agenda of cooperation by, uh, among the BRICS countries shall be probably the enhancement of, uh, of, uh, of other currencies, particularly the right. RMB, uh, as a base for uh, international payments. That, the de-dollarization, which is my... That's right, <laughs> which has, of course, has a, a good space to go when it comes to, to transactions, commercial transactions, and the electronic platforms, the ED, the, the RMB, the digital RMB will be a way in that regard. So you have a, a, a commonality of interest in this case, and that's how the, that's what the BRICS are supposed to to do. Okay. Do you see, and there's an important presidential election coming up in, yes. in October. Do you see any scenario where an incoming president could say, you know what, let's back off. I do not want to be part of BRICS. Yes. Yes. For a single reason. Uh, one of the, the, let's say, the, the candidates that came out uh, well from the primaries in Argentina is exactly one that is uh, proposing at the base of its agenda a dollarization of the Argentina. Argentinian economy, which would run against exactly the resort to other source of currency, strengthening of other currencies in the international payments. That's indeed, and his announcements vis-a-vis, -vis, and also the other uh, uh, opposition candidate that came second in the election has also given declarations. So that's how it's going to be. Right. Uh, you don't have ever uh, a single position by any of these countries, and over time, the scope of cooperation uh, uh, will be will have to be uh, uh, thought will have to be pursued with whoever is in power in those countries. Uh, Anton, uh, thanks for being so patient. I'm sorry it took me so long to get to you, but um, right now I think Elizabeth hit the nail on the head. The first big major uh, gathering for this organization since uh, the pandemic. However, Vladimir Putin not there in person. He was there uh, via video. Um, Putin has been supportive of the expansion of BRICS. What does Russia have to gain after being simply hammered by punishing sanctions for such a long time? Sean, I think the Russians are looking to support the search for alternatives uh, from what we call the global south today. And I think uh, there's uh, quite a bit of historical irony here because Personally, I see the BRICS, and especially this summit in South Africa, as a fairly important um, uh, watershed. Um, it is uh, one of the thicker points that make up a graph uh, that's pointing towards the de-Westernization, mm. uh, a recalibration of uh, geopolitics and geoeconomics. And this process began back in 1955 at the Bandung uh, conference in Indonesia when what was called back then the Third World 
Um, in other words, the non-capitalist, non-U.S. aligned and non-socialist, non-Soviet aligned uh, countries, although many of those countries, by the way, were socialist, but those are details. Um, at that conference, what became the non-aligned movement in the early 60s was born. The problem was that for the second uh, half of the 20th century during the Cold War, um, the whole third world was left in the shadows of the historical stage, which is not to say that things didn't happen. Unfortunately, a lot of bad things did happen there. Right. But uh, those countries enjoyed very little sovereignty. And from their point of view, the Cold War was not really a conflict between the West and the East. It was an internal Western uh, conflict, with Adam Smith being sort of the intellectual father of the capitalist world and Karl Marx, the intellectual father of the socialist world, both of them Westerners. The Indians, on many occasions, said, listen, this is not our conflict. We will pick and choose our side. Well, here we are, um, 30 years after the end of the Cold War, and we're seeing the non-Western world really acquire a voice of its own. And of course, the 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 uh, uh, a part, the major part of the right. former leader, of the second world, Russia today, right, no longer communist, no longer ideological, is one of the leaders of that world. And I think the essence here is mutual respect and no, uh, none of the uh, founding members right. acting like a hegemon and using their currency or uh, using uh, a, a trading or financial system as a bludgeon to bring everyone else in line. And yeah, it looks like the rest of the world is seeing this uh, as a breath of uh, fresh air. Yeah, indeed. One thing I did hear to uh, piggyback on that, it's basically these nations are getting their seat at the big table a after some time. I do want to ask you one thing, Anton. Um, President Ramaphosa has been receiving high uh, marks from so many people from the way he has kind of guided uh, this uh, summit in, in South Africa. And one thing, the fact that the international arrest warrant does still exist for President Putin, and it's been suggested that Putin did not go because he did not want to put South Africa Ramaphosa in an uncomfortable position. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well I, well, I think that's absolutely right. I think that's exactly why he uh, didn't go. Um, uh, it's interesting that, of course, next uh, year's summit will be held in Russia, in uh, Kazan, to which everyone uh, agreed, which in itself is a sign of the, the non-isolated state of uh, Russia. But ultimately, although I understand why in the Western mainstream media uh, Putin's uh, 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 physical absence was uh, made a big point of, um, I have to say that his physical absence was quite irrelevant to the conference. Everything that the conference wanted Wanted, the summit, rather, that it wanted to get done, it could have done uh, with Putin on the screens, as you're showing right, right. now, and with uh, the foreign minister, Lavrov, representing uh, him in person. Absolutely. Uh, Yan Liang, uh, in his remarks at the BRICS Africa Outreach and the BRICS uh, Plus Dialogue, uh, Xi Jinping, China's president, said, and I want to read you this quote, let us stay committed and united to build a community of shared development and make sure that in the process of global modernization, no country is left behind. I want you to kind of pick apart that quote, if you will, because China has been so uh, active in the continent of Africa, building so many uh, railway, highway, power facilities in the nation. Do you think we're going to see more sustainable development from China go up uh, following uh, this conference and, of course, the interest from so many African nations. Absolutely. I think China is definitely taking the lead in fostering, you know, trade and investment and financial reform um, in the global south. I think, you know, China has been uh, investing uh, in green infrastructure in terms of, you know, uh, sustainable energies and also uh, intercontinental, um, you know, uh, infrastructure to facilitate intercontinental, you know, trade, for instance, in Africa. Um, as we all know, you know, South Africa is struggled with power outages and also, you know, the lack of uh, advanced infrastructure, high unemployment. And by the way, also, um, just like Argentina, I think, you know, South Africa is also struggling with external debt, right, um, with, you know, 160 
uh, $3 billion or 47% of the GDP uh, in terms of their external debt. So I think these are really common challenges of the global south, that they are lacking infrastructure, that they are borrowing heavily in dollar loans, which they have no control over the dollars. And so that's why I think it's so important to continue to um, facilitate the kind of trade corporations. You know, China is the largest trading partner of all the BRICS countries, with the exception right. of India. Um, but not just China. You know, Russia now is the seventh largest trading partner of India, and India is the fifth largest trading nation of um, Brazil. So there's vibrant, you know, trade between these countries and also investment. And um, just speaking back on the earlier comments about de-dollarization, um, I mean, it, whether or not this is going to shake the hegemonic power of the dollar is a separate matter, but I think it's so important for these countries to invoice the trade in, in, in their local currencies mm -hmm. to avoid, you know, uh, exchange rate fluctuations, to also increase the borrowing and lending in their local currencies, which is the NDB's goal to increase the their local currency lending from the 20% right now to 30% by 2026. And they also just issued the uh, rent denominated bonds last week, and they're going to do this um, for India's rupee bonds um, in October. So I think all this go to say that, you know, no country left behind, especially for the global south, um, that has been really, you know, under the whim of the global um, north um, with all these unfair uh, trade agreements or uh, of their international lending schemes right. um, that really punish these countries. You know, and, and I also think, um, Elizabeth, moving forward, if you, if you talk about the advances, uh, you have to look at technology. I mean, India landing uh, a spacecraft on the moon yesterday, certainly uh, a very historic moment for that nation. But I want to pick up on something else that Yan Liang just talked about, and that is the power outages uh, throughout the continent of Africa. And we know that uh, South Africa and China signed uh, at eight different agreements so that the nations will work with various Chinese companies to enhance uh, their electric, uh, their energy sector. South Africa has faced these rolling blackouts for years and years and years. Tell me what you think the significance is of this and what it's going to mean to the people. Okay, um, Elizabeth, we're going to try to get you to unmute your. Uh, I'm I'm back. Okay, let's so let's I'm, take another I'm, shot at it, Elizabeth. Yeah, sorry. Um, I said I think I think I, th I think the uh, the agreements uh, over the last couple of days, uh, because of course uh, President Xi also was on a formal state visit to South Africa. I think are are very important for our uh, for our energy. Uh, challenges. Over the last couple of years, South Africa certainly has been uh, working and, and, and engaging with a number of, of external partners on, on, on helping it, both in terms of its renewable energy, uh, but in terms also of, of, of uh, converting its old coal fire power stations, etc. The, the particular uh, agreement with, uh, with China over the last couple of days is, of course, to, to provide power equipment to donate uh, up to 167 million rands worth of, I think, uh, power equipment, but also at the same time to provide a five, 500 million rand grant facility also to assist uh, with that. I think one of the big challenges that we have is really ramping up in a significant way our, uh, as, as, our, as some of our old coal-fired power stations sort of come to mm. the end of their life, really to either create new ones, also to roll out significantly uh, renewable energy, something which we've done uh, in, a, in a rather sort of on-off uh, uh, manner. So that's, that's been, and, and one of the other things that President Ramaphosa has highlighted throughout the, the, the last three days, really, is the importance of trade and investment um, right, right. from the BRICS, both into South Africa and into the continent, taking advantage, of course, of the, the rollout of the African continental free trade area, which is intended to really create, you know, a, a large market of 1.2 billion people uh, uh, trading uh, with each other, but also at the same time uh, creating manufacturing industries so that we're not just exporting or trading in, 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 in raw materials, but actually uh, moving up the value chain. And that was another thing right. uh, that was highlighted by the president. Ataviano, I kind of want to move into your, your strong suit here. Let's talk more about the de-dollarization. We've kind of been okay. dancing around it. Uh, how important is this? What is it going to mean to BRICS uh, dependence? Firstly, I want you to hear what South Africa's president had to say along with the Brazilian president. We are concerned that the global financial and payment systems are increasingly being used as instruments 
of geopolitical contestation. Global economic recovery relies on predictable global payment systems and the smooth operating of banking, supply chains, trade, tourism, as well as financial flows. The creation of a currency for trade and investment transactions between BRICS members increases our payment options and reduces our vulnerabilities. But Taviano, what's behind this um, and what is it going to mean, especially to trade? Well, what it will mean is the following. Uh, there is a scope for the countries to economize on their need to keep stocks uh, of dollars or even other, any other currency that is used for payments. As long as there is some sort of a coordinated mechanism of, uh, of checks and balance with the compensations taking place only uh, periodically. Uh, Latin America uh, South, uh, had a, a scheme such as this until some recent years, and to some extent it's what exactly uh, China has proposed and extended to several departments. Of course, of course, the sanctions, since the sanctions on Iran, the sanctions and then on Russia and, and, and so on, they all have, uh, let's say, compelled these countries to search for alternatives, to, including China doesn't want to be uh, vulnerable to, to any sanctions. Now, uh, there is much to do that can be done with respect to the payments. Uh, uh, the demise of the dollar as, a, uh, let's say, as a, a stock of reserves of the world will only happen when uh, there is also the availability of financial assets that people feel comfortable with respect to the convertibility right. uh, to, to use them as a stock of value, of a reserve of wealth. Uh, China. Uh, did a move in that regard at the time when it was to enter the, 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 the RMB, to enter right. the SDR. Uh, there was a huge outflow and pull it back and, and, and it rather uh, keep it uh, the controls even if that implies a limit to the degree to which uh, uh, the RMB uh, can. One important thing, uh, Sean, uh, I, it's important to realize that, you know, framing the, the, the eventual Contraposition of uh, BRICS and G7 is not a matter of de-Westernization. Uh, in including, uh, there will be, like it happens occasionally among the G7 countries, they, they had a fight uh, uh, in, in the last, in the decade, two decades ago, with respect to the exchange rates of Japan and Germany and so on. There will be also, as well, occasionally, uh, lack of 100% convergence among BRICS countries. See now, India. India's restrictions on, on high-tech products from China. So we should be clear uh, that there is no uh, deal westernization. Right. One final point, uh, some issues in common. Uh, Jan mentioned quite well the issue of debt. Yeah. China as a creditor uh, and uh, uh, who face uh, the same problems that the Western creditors are facing with respect to solving where does the time go? I wish we had more time. So much more I really would like to get into. Uh, I want to thank all of our guests and, of course, you for watching. That does it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Sean Caleb's in Washington, D.C. As always, thanks for watching.